In part 7, we're going to talk a little more about lighting. We talked about ambient, diffuse and specular lighting in the previous part, but we can go beyond those basic lighting types. One kind of lighting I'm a big fan of is called Fresnel, named after this guy. Put simply, it's the principle by which objects become more reflective when you view them at really shallow viewing angles. Unity's lit shader graph does implement this already, and it'll manifest on a sphere mesh as they highlight around the edges. It's actually a type of specular reflection, so it's impacted by the smoothness of the material. Higher smoothness means more Fresnel reflections. If you want to add Fresnel light to your object with zero regard for real-world physical accuracy, we can do that with Unity's built-in Fresnel effect node. You can use this even within an unlit graph, which is what I'm going to do. Let's right-click in the project view and go to Create, Shader Graph, URP, Unlit Shader Graph, and I'm going to name it Fresnel Highlight. I already wired up a base colour and base texture like you've seen a couple of times now. If we go ahead and add a Fresnel effect node to the graph, we'll see three inputs. A normal vector, an overview vector, which in most cases we can just leave alone, plus a power value. If we increase the power, the edges, as it were, of the Fresnel get thinner, and vice versa. You probably shouldn't go below zero, but it won't actually break anything. The output is a floating point number between zero and one. I'm going to use this node to add a highlight effect to my object. For that, I'll add two properties to the graph. One is going to be a float property called Fresnel Power. If I click on it and go to the node settings, I'll also change the mode to slider, leave the minimum value as zero, and set the maximum to something like 20. I will also change the default to one rather than zero, so that the Fresnel light doesn't cover the entire surface of the object by default. The second will be a colour property named Fresnel Colour. This time in the node settings, I will change the mode to HDR. We've used HDR colours before, but to elaborate a bit further, this stands for High Dynamic Range, which in this context means we can force colours to use values beyond the normal range, which in shaders is 0 to 1 for each colour channel value. We do that through the use of an extra intensity option. What this actually does under the hood is multiply each of the red, green, and blue color channels by 2 to the power of the intensity value. So if the intensity is 0, we multiply by 2 to the power of 0, which is 1, which is the same as a regular non HDR color. That's also why closing and reopening an HDR color picker might change the RGB and intensity values because now, there are multiple combinations of these values that resolve to the same colour. It's not a bug, I promise. Anyway, we can drag the Fresnel power onto the graph and slot it into the power input. Then we can take the output from the Fresnel effect node and multiply it with the Fresnel colour property, effectively giving us an HDR-enabled Fresnel. If we choose to use a high-intensity colour, then this amounts to a bright glow that will appear around the object. We can simply add this to the existing base color nodes and output the result to the base color output to complete our graph. Remember to hit save acid so that your changes get saved. In the scene view, we can apply the shader to a sphere like this, and the Fresnel acts like a highlight as intended. This is a really cheap way to bring attention to objects, and you might have seen this approach in games before. However, it only really works properly on spherical and curved objects. Objects with flat faces like cubes don't really get a highlight effect from their shader. We've just dipped our toes into the idea that we can use lighting for non-realistic purposes, so let's dive even further into that concept. With a lit shader, we can supply the physical properties of the object, but what Unity chooses to do with that data is a black box. It'll just spit out some lighting, and we have no control over what it's doing, at least not in Shader Graph. That gives us limited ability to create non-photorealistic objects, often abbreviated as NPR for non-photorealistic rendering. Not to be confused with National Public Radio, of course. What we could do instead is use an unlit shader and calculate the lighting ourselves. This is obviously more involved than just using a lit shader, but we have total control over the resultant light.
I'm going to create a very basic cell shaded effect. With cell shading, light does not fall off smoothly across the object. Instead, there is a hard cutoff between lit and unlit areas of the object. I'll create a new unlit graph via create shader graph URP unlit shader graph like before and name it cell shaded. I will once again start with base color and base texture properties wired up like this. Next, let's recap from part 6 how to fuse light works. It's inversely proportional to the size of the angle between the normal vector, which faces outwards perpendicular to the surface of the object, and the light vector, which faces in the direction of the light. We can model this relationship using the vector dot product. The amount of diffuse light is simply n dot l, as the dot product decreases as the angle gets larger, which is what we want. On the graph, we can get information from the scene's main directional light using the main light direction node. This is a relatively new node, and it's one that I'm extremely happy to see implemented in shader graph by default. This currently points from the light origin to the surface, so we'll have to negate it so that it instead points from the surface to the light origin. Then we can take the dot product of that negate node and a normal vector node. This collection of nodes is doing the basic diffuse lighting calculation. Next we'll deal with the thresholding stage which is crucial to the cell shaded look. There's two ways we could do this. The first involves the step node. This node takes two inputs called in and edge. Essentially if your in input is below the edge input, then the node outputs 0 or black. Otherwise it outputs 1 or white. It's named as such because in math this is known as a step function. Simple. The other way instead uses a node called smooth step. It does exactly what it sounds like it does, whereas the step node introduces a hard cutoff where the output suddenly changes from 0 to 1. Smooth step has a sort of buffer zone where the output values smoothly transition from 0 to 1. So with smooth step, you provide two edge values. If in is below edge 1, the output is 0. If in is above edge 2, the output is 1. And if n is between edge 1 and edge 2, then the output will be something between 0 and 1. This node is great if you want to avoid the razor sharp cutoff you get with step. In my graph, I'm going to go with smooth step. Since it takes two threshold inputs, I'm going to add a vector2 property to my graph called cutoff thresholds. The first component will be used for edge 1, and the second will be used for edge 2. We can go ahead and set that up on the graph using a split node to separate out the two components of the cutoff thresholds vector. Currently, the values output by the smooth step range from 0 to 1. To use this as a lighting value, usually you just multiply it with the base color or whatever you're applying the light to. However, we're going to get some very dark areas of the object if we do that. So I'm going to control the lower thresholds with a new float property called ambient light strength which I will make into a slider between 0 and 1. I want to remap the 0 to 1 range to instead being ambient light strength to 1, and since we're starting off with a 0 to 1 range, the easiest way to do that is with a LERP node. Let's put the smooth step output into the T slot, then the ambient light strength into the A slot, and hard code 1 into the B slot. This gives us the final light value, then we can multiply it with the base color and texture values we started with and output the base color. And that's the graph complete, so let's hit save asset. In the scene view, we can apply the material to our object and we'll see that the light does not smoothly fall off as it curves around the surface like before, but instead has a hard cutoff. Here I'm using the cutoff threshold values of minus 0.02 and 0.02, so we get the cutoff halfway around the object with a very small amount of blending to help soften the edge a little bit. You can also just set these values to be equal, and you will still get a hard cutoff if you want. We've only implemented diffuse light, so there's no specular highlight either. So there's a challenge for you if you want to have a go at adding the specular highlights using what you've learned in this and the previous part. Until next time, have fun making shaders.